So we say that all objects fall with the same acceleration near the surface of the Earth, and we showed you that with Hal and Al. But of course the key is that you have heavy objects so that we can ignore the next force, and that is air drag. Okay, so we could call this a resistive force due to a fluid, really, but in this case the fluid is the air, due to the air, and I'll just call it big R, is one notation. So it's just a vector force, but we'll call it big R. So let's look at it. So what's happening then as an object falls, like one of these spheres, is of course mg is the force pulling it down, and it feels a resistive force R due to the air going around, around the ball. And for Hal and Al, this was so small, it made essentially no difference. But if you get into lighter objects, it can make a difference. So let's see how to calculate it. So the magnitude of the resistive force is one half d rho a v squared. So let's go through what all those are. D is the drag coefficient. It's just a number that kind of depends on uh, the geometry, right? So in this case, and it also depends on how fast you're going and the atmospheric conditions and whether it's alignment or turbulent and all this stuff. But under these typical drop conditions we're doing, it's about a half. So we put in a number of about a half. Uh, rho is the density of air, which is rather low, right? Um, A is the cross-sectional area. Um, of the object dropping, so not the surface area, but the cross-sectional area, whatever the air sees as the ball or the object falls. And then v, uh, v is the velocity magnitude. And the velocity magnitude, or the speed, and it's squared. So we're not going to go through and derive where this formula comes from. It's fluid mechanics, very complicated, but we know that this is a pretty accurate representation of the magnitude of the force, and that's the magnitude. The direction is that it opposes V. It opposes the motion down since it's falling. Right? So that's why I drew the force up. So we know then that this is gonna oppose the motion, and if the object is light, it can actually become significant. The, the uh, air drag can become as large as the weight. So let's think about the kinetics, okay, or the kinematics. The kinematics are complicated because R, the magnitude of R, depends on the magnitude of V. Actually, the magnitude of V squared. So all the kinematics we did, remember, they were for constant acceleration, right? So X is X naught plus uh, V naught T plus one F A T squared. That applied for constant acceleration. And you could say, maybe we'll have constant acceleration. You just subtract this force from this force. But it's changing, right? So we have a varying acceleration. And it's not just varying, it's some um, simple way that we could plug in, it's varying with v squared. So basically it leads to a complicated differential equation that is well beyond uh, this course. So we can't really solve the kinetics, the detailed motion, but we can find the terminal velocity. Okay. Terminal velocity means this will keep accelerating and accelerating. As it accelerates, V will get bigger. And when V gets bigger, R gets bigger. So it gets bigger, and V gets bigger, R gets bigger. Because it's accelerating down because the gravitational force is still winning. The gravitational force is still bigger than this force. But the faster it goes, the bigger this force gets. And eventually, it would reach the point where this is the same size as this. 
eventually, when you reach terminal velocity, that's the point where the sum of the forces equals zero, where the weight is balanced by r. Okay. So to figure that out, we don't have to do detailed kinematics. We just have to say, when is that true? Well, that's true when the magnitude of r equals mg. You just write them as scalars, right? So r was what? 1 half, 1 half d, uh, drag coefficient, density of air, cross-sectional area, velocity squared equals mg. And we're saying when this happens, that's the terminal velocity. So I'll put a big T right there. So it's really a specific velocity. It's not just any velocity. This is any old velocity tells you that force. This is at a specific velocity. These two are equal. So if you flip that around and solve it for vt, you get the square root of, let's say you bring these under here, so you get 2mg in the top, and you end up with d rho a in the bottom. d rho a in the bottom, and take the square root to get vt, and that gives you the terminal velocity if you combine all those parameters. So to check if something's going to reach terminal velocity, there's a few uh, uh, things you can do. For instance, in the sphere drop that we did with Hal and Al, I calculated, if you assume there's no drag force, what speed would they hit the bottom? I got that speed, I plugged it in, I got the, the resistive, or the drag force at that moment, and it was much, much, much less than mg. And what that tells you is this never got very big. Right? And if you think it was going to slow it down to a slower speed compared to having no drag force, so it was really small. It was like 1 one hundredth or 1 one thousandth of mg. But we could look at this and figure out ways to get the terminal velocity to be lower, to where it would basically slow down earlier. Right? And one would be to have a much smaller um, mass. But we want the drag coefficient to be the same. We want the area to be the same. So to we're going to demonstrate this with some new uh, balls. And they look like this. So I have 3D printed some balls to have the same diameter. They're still 76.2 millimeter diameter, three inches. Okay. Um, but what I can do is now the balls all have the exact same way they present themselves to the air. They have the same cross section. They're made out of the same material. But I can print them at different densities. Right? So one of them is completely empty. It's hollow. And one of them is solid ABS plastic. It's like a solid Lego. So we have everything in between. So we can have two balls with different masses, but that look the same in terms of air drag. So now let's see if we can find a place to drop those and see if we see a difference in their terminal velocity. Where should we go? Let's go find a place. This looks pretty good. Here we are at Lovett Hall above the Sally Port Arch at Rice. And it looks like a great place to drop our plastic spheres and look at the effects of air drag. So I have two here. This one was printed at an 8% infill, and it weighs about 35 grams. And this one was printed at 75% infill, weighs about 130 grams. So let's look at how they fall. I'm going to drop them down. And here we go. So we saw the heavier ball on your left fell faster. And that's what we expect. They both feel the same drag force, but it has a bigger effect on the lighter ball. We can also see that in our derived formula for the terminal velocity, it was a square root of 2 times mass times gravity over the drag coefficient times the density of the air times the cross-sectional area. So you would expect the lower mass ball would have the slower terminal velocity. It slows down more from the free fall condition. We can also see that in a velocity time plot. If you were to plot the uh, velocity of one of the balls, it would look something like this. It starts out at 9.8 meters per second squared with that slope right at the beginning. But then the acceleration uh, goes to 0, and it reaches vt, terminal velocity. If you plotted this for the heavier ball, it would look something like this. Also start at 9.8 meters per second squared, but then it would end 
at a different, a higher terminal velocity for the heavier ball. And I've actually calculated them just using this formula. For the uh, <coughs> uh, lighter ball, it only gets to about 15.6 meters per second. That's for the 30, 35 gram ball. And the heavier ball gets to about uh, 30.2 meters per second. That's for the 130 gram ball. But they don't really quite get to that speed. If you estimate how far they would have to fall to get to that speed, it's something like 20 meters. And we weren't really that high. So we really only made it sort of part way up our way to terminal velocity. But you can actually, from this plot, you can see why the heavy ball strikes first, just based on 1D kinematics. It's going faster. They both had to fall the same distance. The heavy ball's going more, going faster, therefore it gets there first. And that's why you saw them hit out of sync. <laughs>